Hi, everyone. Welcome to this year's New York Comic Con. I'm Matt Patches, senior editor at Polygon, and I am thrilled to be talking to one of my favorite people in the spectacle business. He is the director of Mortal Kombat, and let's just say it, with all apologies to Mario and Double Dragons, the first great video game movie, which celebrated its 25th anniversary this year. He's also the mastermind of the Resident Evil movie franchise, which is going to get its first 4K release, all six films in November, and include an extended cut of Resident Evil Apocalypse, which we're definitely gonna have to talk about. And he'll release a highly anticipated adaptation of Capcom's Monster Hunter, which I'm not sure there could be anything more in his wheelhouse. We'll be diving into all of that and showing a tease of Monster Hunter in this panel, so stick around. So first, Let's give a virtual hello to writer, director, producer, Paul W.S. Anderson. Paul, welcome to the Metaverse. Thank you very much, Matt. <laughs> Happy to be here. I am so glad you are here and you have made it onto this call. Um, I, I actually want to start with Monster Hunter. Uh, people with giant swords, fighting monsters, makes a lot of sense for you, I think. Um, after so many years of making action movies, though, I wonder, how did Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter test you as a filmmaker? What was the challenge of bringing that world to life after everything well, you've I mean, seen before? Um, the, the really big challenge, the really big pressure was to do it justice. You know, I'm a long-term fan of the video game. I discovered it in Japan 12 years ago when it was pretty much a Japanese only phenomena before the rest of the world discovered what Monster Hunter was. So, uh, and I started talking to Capcom 10 years ago about adapting it into a movie. So this really is a long-term passion project of mine. And I'm approaching it not as a, just a filmmaker, but also as a kind of long-term player and a fan of it. So I could feel the pressure to kind of do the world justice. And, um, you know, in terms of filmmaking, the thing I fell in love with is, uh, it's, I fell in love with the creatures and all this, also this amazing world that Capcom had created. The landscapes in the video game and, and the world they've made is just incredible. And to do justice to that, I thought I wanna, I wanna film it for real. I don't wanna go onto a studio back lot and shoot against a green screen and just manufacture everything in a computer. Um, so we pretty much went out and found the most incredible landscapes we could. And we went and shot there. So that was the big challenge for me as a filmmaker. I'd never done a movie like that before, where you literally have to go into the middle of nowhere with your entire film crew, live 200 miles away from the nearest town in the middle of these desolate landscapes. We created tent villages for everyone to live in. So there's 350 people living in a tent village where we had to put in water, electricity, both of which kept breaking down you know, living in, um, you know, temperatures that varied from like super insanely hot to below freezing, sometimes in exactly the same location. I mean, it was a, it was a really tough and challenging shoot from that regard. But, you know, I, we felt like adventurers, which was great. We felt like we were in the world of Monster Hunter. Where, where was that location? Where did you film? We shot against? all over Africa, basically. And we wow. shot in South Africa and we shot in Namibia. And a lot of the locations we shot in have never been put on film before. Uh, they've never been seen before. And uh, I think they provide and do justice to the world of Monster Hunter. Because I, of course, I, if I could have kind of built giant 50 foot monsters and shot them for real, I would have loved to have done that. Um, but of course we had to create them within the computer. And I made a decision, if we're gonna create the monsters within the computer, absolutely everything else in the movie has to be as real as we can possibly make it. And I think the reality of those locations really helped, you know, add to the reality of the creatures as well, because the, the animators, when they work on the movie, they have reality to lock these creatures into. It's real dust, it's real sand, it's real lens flare from the real African sun. I mean, it was a, even before we put the creatures in, it was a pretty incredible looking movie, even with just all the empty plates, you know. Wow. We I shot mean, for one, one day with a green screen, that was it. Wow. One day, I swear to you. And we shot two days indoors and the rest of the shooting was all outside. It was in real locations uh, wow. in the natural environment. And that for me was a, you know, a guy who'd grown up doing visual effects movies, a lot of them very studio based. This was a real, it was a real change. It was a real challenge and it was a real adventure. A testament to the visual effects artists too, who don't maybe even need green screen anymore to, to put these effects in and, and make this film what it is. It's well, astounding. it's definitely it's definitely harder for them. 
But, um, you know, if you go out in a real location and you kind of thrash around with the actors and, uh, you know, you, you blow sand at them, you put them in the real environment and then you let the visual effects people sort it out, it always looks so much better than trying to create that chaos and that reality in a computer, you know, nine months afterwards where you're all sitting around drinking cappuccinos going, <laughs> well, how, how can we make this exciting? You know, it's so much better to be stuck in the middle of Africa, in the middle of nowhere, you know, with howling winds, and it is exciting, it's intrinsically exciting. And for the actors, it really immersed them in the world as well. You know, um, uh, we worked with uh, with T.I. and uh, I walked up behind him one time and he, he makes quite a lot of notes in his script. And uh, I said, uh, Tip, what is that? What's that note you have there? And it was N.A. It was no acting required. <laughs> No acting because, you know, you're living it. The, yeah, exactly. We put the actors there. And I think they felt, even though they weren't there, I think they felt the presence of the 50 foot wow. monsters. No, that's what you want. That's what you want. I mean, it seems like a far cry from, I, I think about your first film, which maybe not as many of your fans have seen, 1994's Shopping, which is definitely out there and people can see it and people should see it um, because it's it's a it's a smaller expression of British youth. I remember you telling me once that it was, it was a very personal film, but it also has car chases. Um, it has your DNA all over it. I, I wondered, that, that film premiered at Sundance way back when. And what what were people pitching you after that premiere after shopping came out what were the kind of projects that you were were floated your way or you were pitching against that could have changed the course of your career before you wound up making mortal Kombat? listen i i i'd made one small movie that went down you know relatively well at sundance i wasn't being pitched you know a thousand and one movies it's like here have your pick you know I think even after up, shopping even after that when first you, movie when you grow up in europe there's a lot i mean a lot of kind of europeans kind of feel like the streets of hollywood are paved with gold and all you have to do is get on a plane fly to los angeles and you know the next thing you know you'll be directing a hundred million dollar movie and driving around in a rolls royce um, it, it doesn't work like that. You know, um, Hollywood, yes, it's, it's where most of the jobs are, but it's also the most competitive place on earth when it comes to filmmaking, because all the best actors in the world and all the best directors in the world end up coming to Hollywood. So, you, you know, it's a very competitive environment. So, you know, I can't say that I was offered an awful lot, but um, there were opportunities that came up that I pursued. And uh, one of those was Mortal Kombat. You know, I heard that they were making the movie. I was a huge fan of the video game. I'd played it in arcades in London and uh, I went after it. And, um, you know, being, because I'd moved to LA at that point, being based in LA kind of made it easier for me to pursue that project. When, when you were talking, I know that you played a lot of Mortal Kombat before you made Mortal Kombat, even before you thought you were making a Mortal Kombat movie. Um, and, and you've cited Enter the Dragon as an influence on making that into a functional movie. But what did it mean to you to make a movie that felt respectful to a video game. It was kind of unheard of. Everyone wanted to figure out how to make video games into movies. I feel like you wanted to make Mortal Kombat true to Mortal Kombat, which was rare. How did you do that? Well, I'd, I think first and foremost, I'd immersed myself in the world of the video game. And that's been my approach with all of the adaptations I've done. You know, I come to the movie making process first and foremost as a kind of fan of the subject matter. And, you know, a lot of people were very, um, they weren't very respectful of the idea of kind of adapting a video game into a movie because they said, well, there's no story, there's no character. And of course, if you played Mortal Kombat, you know, yes, it was a fighting game, but there were pretty cool characters in there. And that's why people chose their favorite characters. You know, you wouldn't have given a damn whether you'd played uh, Johnny Cage or Liu Kang if they didn't have characters. You know, I always loved playing Johnny Cage because he was the flamboyant asshole. And I thought, yeah, it's... I like him. I like him. And, uh, you know, so I got into the characters. I got into the mythology of the game. And um, that's what I tried to bring to the movie was was to be true to what the video game was and also try and deliver, deliver these kind of bone crunching fights that the game had. Um, and Are there specific I, for, moves that you wanted to put in the in Absolutely. The you know, there were, yeah, I mean, all of the characters had their specific moves. They had specific ways of fighting. We tried to honor that, you know, Johnny Cage had his shadow kick, you know, um, yeah, there, there were signature moves we tried to put in. And, and above and beyond that, you know, I felt that Mortal Kombat was influenced by Hong Kong and Chinese action cinema. 
And I was a huge fan of those kind of films. And I felt that the techniques used in those films had not been used in an American mainstream movie. You know, no one had used kind of Hong Kong style wire work properly. You know, you've got to remember this is, you know, several years before The Matrix really kind of went in and, and did that on, on a very big budget. Um, but I think we were the first people to really bring over a Hong Kong wire team, you know, to work on some of the stunts um, in, in uh, you know, our Liu Kang, Robin Shu, you know, we had someone who'd grown up within the Hong Kong industry. You know, he's a great actor, but he'd started as a stuntman in Hong Kong. So he was very kind of au fait with, uh, with the kind of techniques and the kind of fighting styles that I wanted to bring to the movie. Because I felt like the first American movie that really brought these Hong Kong styles and stuck them in 2000, uh, 2000 cinemas on opening weekend, there would be a good reaction to it. You know, whether you knew the video game or not. And uh, we, we turned out to be right. Uh, did anything get cut out because you were pushing the technology so much? I mean, the Goro puppet, uh, I think you have talked about being notoriously, it's like the Jaws shark of the 90s in some way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was rewatching the film and you get Liu Kang floating through the air thanks to wire work and doing his big kick move. And that's awesome. I'm just wondering if there's something that, that couldn't happen just because of what making a movie in the mid 90s was like. You know, I, I've always been somebody who tries to limit the amount of CG in a in a movie. I mean, even back then, you know, the, the reason for it was it was very, very expensive, you know. But but I think if you can do things practically, you know, they, they have more impact. And they also stand the test of time. I mean, obviously, Mortal Kombat is a movie that in some regards is dated. But it still holds up pretty good because I think a bone-crunching fight is still a bone-crunching fight, you know. A good fight's a good fight, and it doesn't matter when it was shot. Um, you know, good CG, you know, that dates really fast. You know, what is cutting edge CG? You look at it 10 years later and you go, oh my God, that's deeply embarrassing. Um, so we tried to do as much as possible on Mortal Kombat for real. You know, we went to amazing locations in Thailand. Um, we, we built big sets in Hollywood. You know, we tried to put as much on screen for real as we could. Um, and that's why we went to wire work and uh, tried to stay away from CG. You know, we... Goro was an interesting case in point. You know, he was really difficult to work with because he was a big, complicated animatronic. Real diva. And, um, but, you know, he's, he, he was a diva. All the actors hated <laughs> him because he was always the last guy to, to kind of come out of his trailer, as it were. Red m um, demanded in his rider. So. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, what we got was reality. You know, I could do an over-the-shoulder shot with Goro um, of, of, like, Trevor Goddard playing Kano. And he's really there, you're really shooting over his shoulder. You know, it's not composite that kind of in 10 years time looks really, really dated. And I think doing it practical like that with some CG enhancement, which we did with his lips to kind of help with the lip sync, I think ultimately was the best way to shoot him because if the guy really holds up, you know, he still looks pretty decent now. I mean, he looks like Goro. That's the best part. I mean, yeah. even movies in the 2000s didn't want to like properly represent comic book and, and video game characters. But there was Goro, Goro in this really weird fight movie. It was awesome. Um, I, it's funny. I've, I've, in interviews, you've said that uh, there were some reshoots on the movies, mostly to add fights. People wanted more, even more fights. Is it true that the, the original movie did not well, have a scorpion fight in it? Um, no, we, we always had the fights. What happened was, um, right before we started shooting, um, Bob Shea, who was running New Line at the time, you know, he decided that, uh, we, we had too much money and, um, which I, I disagreed, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, we had, we had like $3 million taken out of the budget. So we had to trim what we were shooting. And a lot of, a lot of that, you know, we had to shoot the story we had. Um, we had to get that on screen. So some of the fight scenes that were good, due to be done in take a week, you know, we had to do in a couple of days. Um, so all the fights were there, but they we couldn't deliver the, the fights that I originally planned. And then we tested the movie and the, the movie was very well liked, but the fans came back and said, there's not enough fighting in the film. It's Mortal Kombat, where's the combat? <laughs> so we basically went and we shot all the stuff that we cut out of the original version of the movie. We shot it all later. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it, additional photography. It was kind of doing what we really wanted to do in the first sure. place. Um, so for example, you know, the scorpion fight was always there, but it kind of ended when Johnny did the, the, the shadow kick. 
and kind of knocked out Scorpion. So it felt like the beginning of a fight, but it didn't feel like a real kind of three ring circus of a fight, which is then what we ended up shooting when we did the additional photography. And the same with, um, uh, with Lou versus um, Reptile. You know, that fight started, but uh, we then continued it and just made more of a meal of it. And uh, then we tested the movie a second time and people just absolutely loved it. Yeah, that, that reptile fight is particularly a, a bruiser. I know it literally bruised a lot of people uh, based on anecdotes, uh, but I, I like the flourishes in there. There's a shot where you have reptile kicking the camera. How do you kick a camera? Yeah. That's, we, uh, we that seems dangerous. It, we, built, we built this thing that we called the Whacker Cam. And it was basically, <laughs> a, we put the camera in a plexiglass box that was on bungee cords. So the cameraman would hold it and then the actors could kick and punch it. And then the camera would react to the kick and the punch. So it looked amazing because you could get a foot or a hand going right into the lens. Um, of course, it was just kind of painful for the actors because you're kicking or punching plexiglass. But, you know, I was working with some tough guys and girls and they all went for it. But, uh, you know, Robin in particular, you know, he always he came from Hong Kong and he he rated them Hong Kong style all the fights, you know, so it would be a one, two or three rib fight. And, uh, you know, if he hadn't bruised three ribs by the end of the fight, he felt like he hadn't kind of done justice to it. Throughout your career, you have been not only a great director, but a producer for other people, and including it within your own franchises, just to truly be like the mastermind of, of Resident Evil. I did wonder if you, looking back at Mortal Kombat and with Mortal Kombat Annihilation, not doing that movie, does that, is that a regret for you? Or did you have ideas for that movie at all? Or were you kind of done with Mortal Kombat? I, I, I don't regret not doing that movie for, for a heartbeat. You know, I was I was offered the movie um, and I just, I'd only made two films at that point. So for another 50% of my career to be making another Mortal Kombat, it was kind of too early for me to be doing sequels. And, um, you know, the movie had been a big hit and it gave me the the freedom to do something that, that I felt was more challenging and which was to kind of explore the dark world of Event Horizon. And um, you know, I'm I'm glad I did that. Um, I'm also glad. You know, I that. I wasn't I wasn't a huge fan of what ended up um, being put on screen for the sequel to Mortal Kombat, and it certainly did kind of make me feel like from that point on, if I was going to be involved in something that was going to be a potential franchise, I would want to kind of be a producer on it and and kind of have more control over it which is what I, I ended up doing. I did, I did three movies when I came to Hollywood where I was just really a gun for hire um, with uh, Mortal Kombat, Soldier, and Event Horizon. And then after that, um, every movie that I made, I was also a producer on pretty much. You are a very visual filmmaker, and a few of your movies even start and go on with, without any dialogue. Several of the Resident Evil films start that way too. Um, but I'm thinking about Event Horizon, Soldier, even Alien versus Predator it doesn't necessarily seem like you're a filmmaker who looks at other movies, but maybe looks at visual art or looks at paintings or photographs. I'm curious about if for like Event Horizon or even Alien vs. Predator, what, what were you looking at when you're coming out with the visuals here? Well, I, you know, I've, I'm a huge fan of cinema. I mean, I love movies. I watch all kinds of movies. Um, some that would kind of shock you because they're definitely not genre movies. Um, like what? And I, Shock us. <laughs> I could pretty much sing you all of the Wizard of Oz right now because I'm watching that with my kids. Like, all right, I think we have time. For, do we have time for that? I think we I don't know. I don't. I, <laughs> um, and um, you know, I, I, I also there's a lot of kind of art house movies that I drew inspiration from, specifically say for something like um, Mortal Kombat. You know, Mortal Kombat was a movie that was budgeted at 21 million dollars, which was you know was a lot more money than I'd ever spent in Europe, but it wasn't a huge budget for an American studio film. And, uh, you know, we had this big epic world to put on screen. And I was very influenced by um, filmmakers like Peter Greenaway, who'd made these very small kind of interesting art house movies, The Draftsman's Contract, um, The Belly of an Architect, Drowning by Numbers, that were done on shoestring budgets, but looked fantastic. Because um, they're all about kind of a uh, painterly composition. You know, his movies look amazing if you look in one direction, but you know, if the camera pans slightly to the left or the right, there's nothing there. You know, there's someone standing at the craft service table, kind of drinking a cappuccino. Um, so everything is composed 
with a very kind of painterly eye. And I, I, that's the kind of approach I took to my filmmaking because, you know, I'm a big fan of paintings and photography, but also you get, you get more bang for your buck that way. You kind of put everything within a frame, you create a frame and you put everything within that frame and you only have to pay for that. And, uh, you know, a lot of studio movies get made and there's an immense amount of waste. You know, what you see on screen is only a small percentage of what they really had. They, they build too much. Um, you know, they, they shoot too much. You know, all of the movies we've made, you know, they've been very precise in, in that regard. Uh, there hasn't been an awful lot of waste. You know, we've never gone and done what a lot of studio movies do, which is shoot huge scenes that they kind of know are not really going to be in the finished film, but they're still working out what the movie's going to be. And they know this ending doesn't work, but they're still going to shoot this ending right now. You know, I've seen that time and time again. And, you know, we, we don't do that. You know, it's a more kind of disciplined approach to filmmaking and yeah. a more kind of, yeah. a, a more painterly approach is what I would say. And specifically, you know, for example, with Event Horizon, you know, the, the influences on that movie weren't so much cinematic as from the world of painting and photography. You know, I was looking at, uh, and we were using a lot of inspiration from Hieronymus Bosch, uh, from Bruegel, um, from uh, Joel Peter Witkin, who's an amazing American photographer. You see, you see his work very strongly in the, the visions of hell and Event Horizon. Jumping ahead to Resident Evil, I mean, you made a really good video game movie and then you went back and like dared yourself to make another really good video game movie. What did you want to do with a movie version of Resident Evil that you couldn't experience in the game? I know you love that game. You played it. I think you once told me that it was you were just deliriously playing it in your basement for hours and hours on end. But like, what did you, what what couldn't you get from the game that you wanted to put on screen? Well, I think a, a gaming experience and a filmmaking or film going experience, they're two different, they're two different things, you know, to play most games, you know, it requires, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours worth of input of your time, you know, to go see a movie, it's two hours, you know, they, they operate in different ways. And uh, specifically for me, what I was very excited about when I did uh, Resident Evil was I, I was a huge fan of the movies that had influenced the video game. So I could see I could see that the creators of the game had loved the same kind of movies that I did from the 80s. And, uh, and it was a, you know, Resident Evil was an opportunity for me to kind of not only adapt the game, but also pay homage to the kind of movies that I'd loved from Lucio Fulci, from George Romero, um, from all of the kind of zombie, zombie movies that I'd grown up watching in the 1980s. My understanding is that the studio wanted a male lead for that franchise or for just that first Resident Evil movie, but you you landed on Alice. And I'm wondering why you went that direction, even over the characters existing in the game. Um, why why Alice? I, you know, I've always been drawn to um, female-led movies. I, I, I just, I like them. You know, if you look at the films I've made, quite often they have strong female leads. When I first came to Hollywood, there was this belief that female-led action movies just didn't work because there'd been several that that hadn't worked. And I just thought that was just bullshit. You know, I didn't believe it for a second. And, uh, and so I pushed very hard to have a female lead in the role. And also, you know, uh, Resident Evil had been developed for a little while by other filmmakers who had had other screenplays written that had never got made. They always had male leads. So I, you know, I, I think I, you know, felt like it was time to try something completely different. And if you look at the game, while the Alice character is not in the game, I mean, the archetype certainly is. There's a lot of very strong female characters that you get to play in the game. Uh, but by, by having a completely fresh character and telling a prequel story to the world of the video games, it gave us some more dramatic license that we wouldn't have had if we'd done just a straight adaptation of any one of the games where the gamers would come to the the movie knowing exactly what the mystery beats would be, who was going to die when, you know, I think it wouldn't have been a great filmmaking experience or film going experience if we'd had to just slavishly follow one of the games. How did you, you wound up incorporating a few more game elements into the future Resident Evil movies, the sequels, were, were those um, big questions of what that, you wanted to include as you went along or? Even even the, the first movie, I mean, the first movie, the DNA of that movie was so clearly immersed in the world of the video game. I mean, 
every single piece of production design, even tiny stuff like the lettering on the side of the train. I mean, it's all taken straight from the video game. So yes, we gave you a fresh set of characters, but I think these characters, um, you know, they were all archetypes taken from the game and they were new characters that were entering the world of the game. For me, it was almost like you were playing a fresh installment of the game, but you were you were seeing that installment in a cinema rather than kind of buying it and putting it in your, your computer game system. And, and that's something that Resident Evil, the game had done over and over again. You know, when the second game came out, it used completely different characters to the first game. So, you know, this was a franchise that was used to kind of um, uh, putting new new characters in it. Based on the first movie and based on the final chapter, which came out a few years ago, it seems like the laser corridor sequence in that first movie is kind of quintessential. It feels like everything you love about movies is in that laser sequence. Am I am I on to something here? Is this is this the grand thesis of Paul W. Sanderson? Is it all about lasers cutting people up? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's not to like about that, right? Exactly, exactly. Or what do you what do you think of that scene was, now? Is that something something up for you? It was a scene. It was a scene that when I first watched the movie with an audience, the audience went crazy. You know, really, really worked, and that really stuck with me. And that's why I think we revisited it several times in the franchise, and we did different twists on that laser sequence. Um, and that's why, you know, I think. Uh, even the creators of the video game, you know, they loved it so much they ended up sticking it in the video game as well. You know, I, I think what I like about it is it plays with your expectations, you know, it sets something up and you think you know what's going to happen and then something completely different happens. And I think, you know, that's one of my approaches to genre filmmaking. I think genre audiences are so smart. You know, they've seen everything and they're, they're always trying to be one step ahead of the filmmaker. So if you actually manage to kind of to lead them down the garden path a little bit and do a bait and switch and actually take a genre audience by surprise. If you can do that, I think you've really done your job very well. Has there been something throughout the Resident Evil movies where you, you wondered to yourself, like, are we going too far or is this going to work? And then you did it anyway and it was bloody mayhem and wonderful. I'm wondering. <laughs> it all seems um, to have worked out. So that's the good news. You know, we never tried to jump the shark as it were. You know, I wanted to keep it all, you know, you're, you're operating within a, a slightly heightened world, but that world has to have rules. And we always tried to stay within them. You know, Mila's character is super powered, but we tried to keep the, the, the rules of her powers kind of consistent. Um, so we, we, tried, we tried not to do something that was so outrageous that we think, oh my God, is anyone really gonna <laughs> buy this or not? I, I will say, I feel like the movies, are very unique in the way that they use music and from Manson, Slipknot, you know, just like a, a certain type of audience, um, someone who wants to go to the movies and be seen, uh, gets to be seen by the Resident Evil movies because of, of the music. And I'm wondering how music was important to you, even over the sequels, like changing the styles of the sequels. How, how is it your love of music that leads you there or? You know, music's always been uh, the, one of the most important parts of cinema. I mean, I think cinema started as a silent medium, you know, unless you had someone bashing away at a piano. Um, so I've always been, I've always treated it as a very, very visual medium um, with, with kind of music coming in second and then probably dialogue coming in third. And, um, you know, that's always made the music choices very, very important. And um, I'm, gl I'm glad you pick up on the fact that it's different music for different movies in the Resident Evil franchise, because my approach is always to try and make each installment of the franchise a slightly different kind of film. The first movie being a kind of haunted house film, the second movie being more of a, an expansive action movie, um, the third movie being very much a kind of post-apocalyptic road movie, the fourth movie being a siege movie and so on. Um, and I've tried to kind of have different music to reflect that and also quite different styles. I mean, I think if you look at Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil Final Chapter, I mean, they really, they kind of look like they were shot by different people. You know, visually, they're very, very different films, even though it's exactly the same team that's making them. Your, your movies play very well overseas, especially in Japan. And I wonder if there was any conscious effort to connect the Resident Evil movies to their Japanese roots uh, as Biohazard, as, as a Japanese property. Um... I mean, I've always loved um, 
Japanese culture and, and aspects of, I think Japanese graphic design, for example, is the best in the world. So I've always felt there's a lot of great stuff to be taken from Japan. And um, that's why in the very first movie, you know, we used a lot of kind of Japanese inspired architecture. You know, the, the hive was created of these big slabs of concrete, um, which kind of light played across. So it was very much like a kind of Tadeo Ando piece of architecture. Um, so uh, I'm sure he'd be horrified by that because there's a man who makes a lot of churches and uh, we made a horrible underground facility where people got eaten alive in. But the fact is, you know, we were I'm very, praying very on that altar. I'll, I'll tell you what. Just... <laughs> very, very influenced by um, by Japanese design. Um, and we I always have been, you know, in all of the films, but it seemed particularly appropriate with with Biohazard because it was a Japanese creation. And then also with Monster Hunter as well. You know, it's a, it's a Japanese game. And that's why, you know, for for a lot of our movies, we've had the world premieres in Japan because it just felt like the most appropriate thing to do to kind of pay homage to the country where a lot of these pieces of IP originated. Can you tell me anything about the extended cut of Resident Evil 2? You mentioned that, you know, you tr try and shoot proficiently so that there is nothing left over. And yet there's something left over about Resident Evil 2. Well, there's more zombie strippers in it. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> I um, It was so funny. I, I talked to, I actually wasn't there when they were cast, but uh, the casting director called me and she said, I've never seen so many producers in a casting session in my life. So there's there's a little more of that. There's more comedy in it because um, we trimmed down some of the comedy. Um, there's a few more um, action beats. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting cut. It's definitely worth watching. I mean, it's definitely, you know, sometimes there are these different cuts that are, you know, you go, oh, that's it. You know, I got three seconds of something that I didn't really want. You know, this is definitely a slightly different take on the movie. You still get Resident Evil 2 on 4K, so that's important. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you'll get you'll get both versions so you can compare and contrast them. Uh, this is something I've only started to put together over the years, but you, I know you love Chris Lambert, who played Raiden in Mortal Kombat, big movie star at the time. Um, yes. And you later hire, hired Russell Mulcahy, Russell, Russell Mulcahy, who directed Highlander, and, and he directed Extinction for you. Do you love Highlander, like, a lot? And I feel like they've been trying to remake this movie forever. Has anyone ever called you about remaking Highlander? There can be only one, baby. <laughs> even, even though, as Christoph told me, oh, there can be only one, but, you know, we made six of them. <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I, I love the first Highlander. I mean, I love it with a passion. It was, um, it was a landmark movie for me as a, as a film goer because I... It had a visual style that I'd never really seen before that Russell pioneered. Um, you know, these low sweeping camera shots. It was very epic and operatic and, and romantic and lush. Um, it, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I, I really love that movie, um, especially the first one. I mean, I like the franchise, but the first one is really the standout film. Um, hard movie to remake, I think, because it's such a movie of its time and you know the queen soundtrack and everything was just magnificent do you think the book is closed on alice for you and mila what did you want did you get what you wanted out of the final chapter listen we I, after after making you know six movies uh, 1.2 billion dollars you know the most successful video game adaptation ever you know i'm very you know i i think we did our job you know we did great work we closed it up really nicely and you know, now we've launched into something brand new, which is Monster Hunter, and I'm very excited to kind of put my energies into that. Well, speaking of Monster Hunter, let's talk about Monster Hunter a little more. Um, what what did you see in the franchise? I, I guess what I'm curious about, what did, you've been talking about this movie with Capcom for 10 years. Um, what did you see in it, and what did Capcom really want you to bring to it? Um, it's, I, I think Capcom knew that I was, you know, Having having turned their video game into the most successful video game franchise ever, they were getting a you know a good a good set of hands, but also I think a passionate set of hands as well. You know, I was the you know when when Monster Hunter World came out and sold kind of fifteen million copies a, a year and a half two years ago, every Hollywood studio in the world was chasing Monster Hunter because suddenly they're like, oh, big sales, let's go grab it. And they were all very disappointed to discover that I already had the rights to it. But I would pursued the rights when no one knew about it outside of Japan. And I think also, you know, that passion for their, for their project, I think, is something that Capcom really, 
respected. And then also, I think the the passion that I brought to it and the closeness of my relationship with the creator of the game as well. Um, you know, we work very closely with Capcom on this one, much closer than on any other movie I've made. Uh, they were very, very involved with it. And I think they, right the way along throughout the 10 year process, they could feel my passion to make this an outstanding movie. Well, what were those? I mean, you said you, the, the relationship was closer than ever. What, what did that bear? Um, what, what were those conversations well, for, like? Yeah, we, you know, we talked through the script and what that would contain, what creatures would be in the movie, which landscapes would be in the movie. Um, when we were designing the costumes, uh, we'd send photographs of all of the costumes to Japan and they'd say, well, you know, the, the hunter's collar should be a little smaller. <laughs> you know, the admiral's ax could be a bit bigger. You know, we- It can always be bigger. Was, Everything was run by them. And um, so they, they got input into absolutely everything. And then, you know, in the process of making the movie also, you know, I would fly to Japan with rough cuts of the fight sequences with the creatures. And, um, you know, the actual game animators would comment on the movement of the creatures and the movement of the creature isn't exactly right. Here, the creature would be a little lower. The stance would be slightly different. Uh, the toenails of the creature are too pointy. That was a, that was a great note. I mean, I'm like, oh my god, you're looking at the toenails of the creature. I'm looking because Mila's going to get eaten. She's going to have her head bitten off by the creature. <laughs> but you know, they cared enough to kind of look at the toenails and what they exactly look like. So, and we took all the notes because we wanted it to be for fans of the game for us to put these creatures on screen as accurately as possible. Mm. Um, so, you know, it was across the board the you know, the cooperation. And it was great because, you know, I'm coming to it as somebody who is a fan of what they have created. Um, totally. So it's nice to kind of pay service to that and and to do justice to it. And you brought Mila back. I mean, you guys have done so many movies together through Resident Evil years and what, what and even more, uh, Musketeers. What's her character like in this movie? How does, and how does Tony fit in? Uh, Tony it's a very, very different character to, for her to play. She's never played a character like this before. You know, when you play the video game, um, you play an unnamed hunter. And I wanted to kind of recapture the feeling of when I first played the video game. I came to the game not knowing anything about it. And I, as a stranger, I was immersed in this world containing these amazing landscapes and these amazing creatures that would kick my ass. And I thought, I want that. That should be the, that should be the film going experience as well. So in many ways, Mila is the avatar for the audience. She's the, she's the newbie going into this world. She's the person from our world that knows nothing about the Monster Hunter world that's going in for the first time. And, and what's nice for the game players about that is it kind of, it recreates your first experience when you first played Monster Hunter. But also what's nice is that it doesn't exclude anyone. Because if you don't know anything about the game, she's the character who goes, oh my God, what are these creatures? What is this world? How does it work? And then you have characters like Tony Jaa's character or uh, Ron Perlman's character, you know, who are characters from the video game who know everything about that world and basically take her under their wing and have to educate her. Um, and she, she plays a kind of fierce warrior from our world, um, but the skill she's learned as a US Army Ranger, which is badass in our world, those skills don't mean too much when you're fighting these 50, you know, these 50 foot tall monsters. And all of the weaponry that she would, would be very useful against a bunch of human beings, it doesn't quite work so good against a Rathalos and Diablos. So she has to learn a new way to fight and she has to learn how to cooperate. And I feel that's one of the main themes of the video game that I really liked was cooperation is key. You have to fight with other people. You have to cooperate with other people to bring down these big creatures. And I, I think that that's a good message for our world right now. You know, we live in such a divisive world um, where people are kind of closing off their borders and closing off their minds that to have a movie that in the most fun way possible basically tells you that people from different cultures, from different backgrounds need to cooperate for the greater good. For me, that's a, that's a good message for our times. Timely, yeah. How, how did everyone do with the giant swords and, and weapons? It doesn't seem easy to swing a giant they sword. They were not. They were not. <laughs> Ron Perlman complained a lot. I mean, he picked up his axe and he twirled it, but he said, oh my God, Paul. And uh, 
you know, then we lit it on fire in it as well. And he's like, you couldn't make this any worse, could you? So he's got this big ax that's on fire. And um, Tony, of course, was a star. He was the one who had to carry most of the weapons. He's got this giant jaw blade, this great sword, which was huge. Um, I mean, bigger than he is. And he has to carry that and the great bow, which again is taller than he is, and kind of do these elaborate fight scenes. I mean, he was a real master. He really impressed me that he he could handle these weapons because they're very, very outsized because that's one of the features of the game. It's these big, bad, bad weapons. And we had to build them big. You know, we had to build them outsized. And Tony, God bless him, he he managed to twirl that huge blade. It was amazing. Can you talk a little about the monsters that we're going to see in, in Monster Hunter? I, I think a few of them have been revealed, but does one in particular make you uh, giddy? Who who are we going to see uh, in this I mean, movie? I, I love the Rathalos because the Rathalos is pretty much the rock star of mon the Monster Hunter video games. It's been in nearly all of the games. It's probably one of the hardest creatures to kill. Um, it's just badass. So I'm very excited that that's in our movie. Um, and then also I love the Black Diablos. The Diablos is a creature that I just like, but the Black Diablos is particularly nasty because that's a, that's a female Diablos that's in heat. So it's just very angry. Um, uh, but very uh, territorial. <laughs> you said that. You said that. Um, let's, is, is there a cute monster we're going to see in this movie? Some cute well, ones? you know, we, you couldn't make a Monster Hunter movie without having a palico in it. So we, we definitely, we lean into the palico. Um, and we, uh, we have one of the characters, Miascular Chef, who's like, who's the kind of Admiral's kind of sidekick, um, <laughs> who's a fantastic character, who has this rather kind of, flirtatious relationship with Mila, which is kind of really interesting. The internet is going to have a meltdown when that happens. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're all anticipating that. Um, well, look, you mentioned the Rathalos. I think this is probably a pretty good time to show off some footage from Monster Hunter. We have it here. It's a short clip, but it's definitely going to give you a taste, everyone watching, of, of what this movie is all about. Let's watch that footage right now. Oh my god. Uh so that was a really that was a it's not a Rathalos. Let's be clear. That is not a Rath that's a greater Rathalos, I believe, is the term we're it's going a, with in this movie. It's a it's a new and improved version. We joked that we kind of uh, we fed it GMOs, so we kind of made it really <laughs> bigger and better. But it's um it's it's a bigger version of the Rathalos than you would see in the games. And the reason for that is it's uh it's kind of uh it's associated with this ancient civilization, which is a theme that runs through several of the games. And uh, so there's, there's a kind of secret associated with this greater Rathalos that people will discover when they see the movie. It's just also a big dragon, and I love big-ass dragons. Uh, it's just well, it's lighting doesn't things on fire. See, who doesn't want to see a dragon eat an aeroplane? I mean, come on. That's, they never I, had that in Game of Thrones. I feel like, uh, and maybe, I don't know if your head was there because you've been talking about this movie for 10, 10 years, but uh, rewatching the final chapter the other day, uh, you get a little taste of Monster Hunter in the final chapter. I mean, Alice is fighting a, a mini dragon, maybe not a great well, we, we were. I was definitely thinking of it, definitely, because, you know, at that point we were actively developing Monster Hunter. So I was kind of trying out some techniques for that. You know, because it's not, you know, filming kind of 50s, foot high monsters it's not as easy as you might think because you know when when you have monsters in a traditional movie you know you have a guy in a suit with some tracking markers and all the actors can look at the guy who's pretending to be the creature when the creature's this big it's like what do they look at how do you make sure everyone's looking at the same thing so what we ended up doing was something we we pioneered when we were doing resident evil which is kind of the use of drones where you'd have a drone and so you can get the drone to the right Point, right height so it can everyone can be looking at the right thing and then also that drone can kind of you can use it as the creature's point of view shot of the actors the tiny little actors down below that you're trying to stomp on i'm very excited to see monster hunter i'm also excited to see the non-cg version of monster hunter where everyone's just running away from drones that's its own post-apocalyptic movie right there um well to, to wrap up here paul 
you mentioned this a little earlier, but Monster Hunter, is it, is this an investment for you? Do you see yourself, is this the opening chapter of, of something bigger? Is that the hope? I'm so sorry, you kind of cut out there. Could you repeat that? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so just to wrap up here, Paul, I, I, you mentioned this a little earlier, but I'm wondering if Monster Hunter is the beginning of something new for you. Is Are you invested in Monster Hunter? Is this the opening chapter to something? Can we expect, you know, planting a seed here with monsters, a monster seed? And listen, I, I love Monster Hunter. It was It was my favorite movie of any movie in my career to make, you know, wow. just the experience of kind of going out to these incredible landscapes and building a team spirit with the crew and the actors, you know, us against the the environment in a way. It was something truly special. So, you know, it's definitely a world that I would love to continue exploring, but we always take it one movie at a time, you know. We, we want to kind of kick ass with this film first before considering doing anything else. That's fair enough. And we, and we will see it soon. All the Resident Evil movies coming out on 4K in November. Mortal Kombat, I watched it on Netflix last night. Still a damn good movie. Paul W.S. Anderson, thank you so much for talking to us thank at Comic-Con this year. Thank you. And for everyone who watched, keep watching Comic-Con. Thanks from Polygon. And I'm Matt Patches. Have a good day.